All right, soldiers, so I've got a special treat for you guys today. It's a rare thing when I can actually pull Amir from code and uh, put him in front of a microphone and ask him to tell us some stuff because, as you can imagine, I'd rather he just sit down and uh, do the work uh, because it's a major integral part uh, in the studio, in the game, of course. And I wanted to take this opportunity because we both agreed that it's a good point to stop and maybe reflect a little bit because I think uh, Mil, correct me if I'm wrong, you've told me this uh, several times, but now this seems like it's the real deal that we're going to be slowly transitioning into just pure gameplay. I thought this would be a nice way to maybe stop for a bit and uh, reflect on the road you've uh, been through so far with us and uh, yeah and it's been it's been quite a road it always is though with games <laughs> so it, it is actually a really good place to kind of stop and and look back because as you've said uh the engine has gone through maybe a couple of iterations uh, we're not going to talk about all of them in depth but mm -hmm. we are at the point where we are now ready to write the systems we're capable of writing systems that work and run in the game and actually create the basis of the salt engine and then the basis and expansion into the born to build game itself for me it's really just even doubly more exciting because as you guys saw on youtube i've made the assets rather early and i've said this multiple times game development isn't exactly linear so mostly visual assets can be done before the game is made or recently i heard like in uh, i showed you i think i even sent you the video of the game designer who worked on wildstar that they just worked on code for like three years and then they didn't have a setting or classes or mechanics or art or anything so there's no like one way to make uh, to make a game but I think combining with the fact that we all still have our jobs, thankfully, and uh, some of you know from the Discord, I'm switching jobs, so busy doing freelance, was, which is why we haven't had a new devlog or a podcast in a while, but the next devlog is also going to be a big one. I'm going to hold off on the reveal for that, but it's a really cool announcement that I'm excited to make. Back to why I'm excited, because I've been waiting for a less meal knows, because I've been reminding him of this every week that I, one of my favorite things to do with games is to just tweak the numbers and adjust the design and the systems. Uh, as you and I worked on a previous uh, game, you know, it's me asking for the basics, you know, I want the player to jump, I want movements, physics and all that, and to just tweak it to perfection is something that I really enjoy doing and I can't wait to start doing it. So before we get into the gameplay, uh, aspect of things I thought uh, you could uh, just take us through uh, because it wasn't completely structured to just go through the way the engine works maybe just you know the bare bones stuff don't have to go into crazy amount of detail but to just share your screen and uh, take us through it and share your thoughts on the process all right so uh, with code it's kind of hard to know where to start because for example we're currently sitting at about around about 15,000 lines of code that we have, and if you ask me, about 50 lines of code that we've already erased. <laughs> so it's always a sort of pull and push. I think the first thing I would like to show is that our engine and our systems, and as much as I can, we're actually following something called test-driven development, which isn't quite what people, most people think about it. Most people think it's so you have to write stuff and then you write tests and you, it's it's basically what I do is I envision the ideas that we want to have. We use our own project management sort of process and then I write the tests that completely fail. They, they don't even build and then I kind of build the functionality to, to pass the test. So you give it a second. As you can see, ah, I actually have... A couple of fails which is great these fails are in the asset pipeline which means that somebody has changed something and it's most likely the uh, json serializers they have been giving us issues <laughs> so you can see we have 419 tests this is just for the basic framework of the game and 99 percent of them pass <laughs> so it's very very important for me to have as much coverage of the functionality 
of the framework that I that I need and want because as you can see when somebody changes something when something changes I can easily see where and I can easily see what breaks and it's easy to fix so it's just from and again I'm gonna be the the viewer here and I'm sure we have uh, people more uh, in line with code than me but that just I remember you speaking about this that when you have something that goes wrong you want to know exactly where and to address it more I guess surgically in a way yeah, so these specific free tests have been have failed before. They there's an issue with the linking uh, of the JSON, the the Newtonsoft JSON library that we use. The engine uses version 13, but this particular testing framework uses version 9. So sometimes it builds. This is a Visual Studio bug, by the way. This is not my bug. <laughs> I've I've tried solving it. Uh, in different ways and in different but it's not it's not entirely my fault mm -hmm. so basically what we have is we're using functionality from json for newtonsoft json 13 and the testing framework doesn't know of that functionality because it's actually linked against version 9 and the way that linking works of dynamic libraries is that i can't actually change it it's it's hard coded mm -hmm. to version 9 so i do have some ways to bypass it and usually if i rebuild the game and it's gonna link to the correct jasons let's see if it does it again yeah see now it now i've rebuilt the engine and the linking is working again i see so that's this is particularly this this particular issue <laughs> is known and we've got an, a ticket open for it hopefully at some point they'll fix it maybe not net 7 maybe in the next visual studio these tests are unit tests which means that they most of them stand completely isolated they don't actually they don't actually test the integration of the systems not not as much some of them may in a, in a very sort of roundabout way but these are not integration tests these are unit tests we use them to actually drive functionality as you can see the most tests that we have are in the ECS library and in the asset pipeline. Those are the most complicated aspects of the game engine. And I'll explain what the ECS library is in a minute. And because of that, it has the most tests. You can see, I do try to construct all of my naming. They follow the same naming convention and I try to make them as explicit and as expressive as possible. So you can see our tests of the MECS. Uh, we test the component collection and then a new collection. And we check checking collection type, checking component count. All of this is uh, ex very expressive. In my tests, it is the only the only type of classes and functions that you'll see that I use underscores in lowercase in in the class the class names and the function names because our, i want to differentiate the tests from the rest of the code also it's the easiest to read every other every other class name and function follows something called camel case uh standards mm -hmm. so you were going to say we just finished you were just finishing up technically the ecs system right yes so I'll, I'll go into details into what an ECS system is. I just want to take sort of, I just want to give an overview sure. of what the engine is. I'm not a big believer in, in concepts such as engines in and of itself, like Unity or Unreal. Mm -hmm. I find that idea a bit restrictive and I, I don't think it was that good for the industry to actually sort of standardize um, behind that particular concept of an engine. Mm -hmm. I think our engine is more of a, a framework and a collection of tools to make games. Yeah. I mean, some people, as you know, already I remember you and I were in the same room when we were asked the same question. Is like, what are you guys trying to to overthrow <laughs> Unity? And it's, it's less about that and it's more about creating a framework for the studio for future projects, yeah. not just born to build. Because I mentioned this previously, you have to think ahead when you're willing to dedicate years of your life to a project or a company or a studio, might as well, you know, make your own tools should you choose to do so. And if you enjoy the process, you 
are one of the few programmers that I personally know that they enjoy that process. It's just not a very common thing, so I understand why Unity and the other engines exist and how I think they did help other programmers express themselves, you know, make their own games. There have been phenomenal games made in these engines. But this is not like a, I would say, a statement against. It's just a different path to take to game development, which also has existed for years and will hopefully still exist. I agree completely. I use Unity in my day-to-day job, and it is a very good engine. It's got its own niggles, but for what it does and what you need it to do, and for a commercial uh, environment, I think that it's most of the time the right choice. Yeah, so, all right, take us through it. What's the All right, what's so... The we're going to start at the most basic level, and this is a C-sharp. Uh, we're writing the engine in C-sharp, and because that's the language that I'm most familiar with at the moment, and .NET 6 and 7 have introduced a lot of optimizations to the language, which make it a lot faster than what it used to be. It's not C-level fast, it's not C++ level fast, but it is uh, fast enough for what we need right now, and it gives us a whole host of other cool stuff we can use. So what you're looking at right now in this screen, this is the main entry point into the into the game, into the engine. Right. right. So every C program, every C sharp program, every Java program has an entry point into the application, and this is ours. Our application actually the entry point doesn't do anything to do with the game. It looks to something called the bootstrapper. And we're bootstrapping the engine. And everything, once we start the bootstrapping sort of process, the engine loads itself. And then the engine looks for the game that is currently supposed to run, and it loads the game. This is the reason we've made it this way, is specifically because Born to Build is one game. And Salt and Sodium, you'll see in a minute, is a framework that is designed for us for more than one game. So it's, it was important for me to instill that idea to begin with, that this is not an act out thing. Mm-hmm. This is actually a framework upon which we will build. Yeah. And because uh, I hope you can see on the side, this is the solution explorer. And because I like to keep to a theme <laughs> and we've decided that our theme <laughs> is salt. Yeah. I remembered, I remembered Grandy's reaction to that. He was like, oh. <laughs> You're really committing to this. I am committing to this, and I'm committing to this 100%. And uh, so the the <laughs> API level of the engine, we have two. We have actually three levels for the engine. The top level is the API, the application programming interface, and then those are the interfaces and basically common technology that is completely agnostic to anything that lives underneath, to anything that that is an actual renderer or serialization or asset importers, those exist in the engine level. So the API level is called Sodium <laughs> for the, um, for the uh, engine part of the engine and Chloride for the uh, editor part of the engine. Means- and when you put Sodium and Chloride together, you get salt. Yep. <laughs> Now when I'm thinking about it, it makes me laugh so much. Uh-huh. By the way, just as a point of, uh, you'll see when you get the the final output of the build, and when, as players and the people who listen to us, will start playing the game, you will notice that, for example, we have the engine uh, section of the folders called NACL, uh, which is the, of course, the... Uh, <laughs> the sodium chloride chemical elements and everything that that has been salted which is anything that has been imported and can be used by the engine lives in the pantry because that's where you pulled salted things i i didn't know i didn't know what i unleashed when i decided to call it salt i just called it salt because if you look at salt under a microscope it looks like voxels that's like the only reason <laughs> i chose it you just go on and went completely so uh, yeah, so I run with it. I'm a programmer, which yeah. a lot of times means technical people, but I, I, I do have a flair for the, the pros and theatrics. Yeah. So as you can see, Sodium is actually made out of a few uh, basic library or project files in this case, mm-hmm. and 
They're pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. We're going to go into the SCS in a minute. Mm -hmm. The most basic aspect and thing that touches everything is the logging framework that we have. We have our own logging framework. And you'll notice even in the logging framework, my folders are data, enums, extensions. I think I have utilities. But you'll see that in all of the code that I write, I try to keep it very structured and very similar. So even if, if the next programmer that comes in, he doesn't like my naming conventions, at least he can see that it's consistent mm -hmm. across the board because then it's easy to get into it and it's easy to find things. Yeah, sure. Once you go down from the sodium level, the sodium provides, for example, the game driver interface. This is, this is the game driver interface itself. It doesn't know anything. This is what we pass around mm -hmm. uh, because this game driver is, it started off as an implementation in Monogame and then it went to become our own implementation when we switched the rendering system. So this is the, these are the basic common functions, functionality that we need for a game driver. Mm -hmm. We have a game scene, which doesn't really have much at the moment. And we have a game window. The game window is the system window. It basically allows us to close, open, resize it. Uh, mm -hmm. We currently use SDL, the c -sharp binding of SDL2, to create windows. So Sodium is the top level element is of our engine. And then we go into, if you'll notice, Chloride is the editor level, uh, the editor API. And as before, it has an interface for the game editor. It has an interface for the entity selection uh, objects that's responsible for selecting entities in the editor. So we can actually manipulate the game scenes. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. You have data, enum, extensions, attributes or attributes that you attach to classes and changes, which are basically event argument mm -hmm. uh, classes. So then we go into the salt engine and the salt engine provides the most common implementation of components and systems which are going to exist for any game that requires voxel rendering. Mm -hmm. uh, other games, for example, if they're not going to be voxel based, once we make them in a few years, we're going to replace this particular layer with a different renderer. Sure, even though we have been playing around with ideas and to try and, you know, I believe, I firmly believe in restrictions when it comes to game development. And I think that working around a voxel environment or voxel, uh, let's call it, strain of thought is something that uh, both me and uh, Heyman found interesting. So I think we will stick to voxels in the near future. Uh, but that's just, you know, wishful thinking for the far, far future. But yeah, it's just to point out that you made it uh, modular. I think that's the word, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, one of the reasons we've I've also sort of structured it like this is because at the moment, all of our systems are running locally. Yeah. What we're going to do once we have the networking up and running, we're actually going to change because everything uses interfaces. We don't specifically need to know whether your systems, whether your components, whether your, di your data exists locally or remotely. The, the actual systems don't need to know that. Mm -hmm. So we'll just plug in, instead of the local client salt, we'll plug in the network salt. Mm -hmm. And then it should basically just switch it over to the networking part of the engine. Sure. We are using a renderer called Veldrid, which is a very thin API layer over OpenGL, Vulkan, and DirectX. It was written by Eric something with an M, I'm very bad with names. I'll put his name up. Yeah, he's one of the .NET developers. He's an amazing developer. Very good. <laughs> and yeah, the API is really helpful to start. It's basically bindings for C-sharp to use OpenGL and, and Vulkan easily, where we're running currently on the Vulkan. At some point, though, uh, once we do have a little bit of time, once I have a little bit of time, I'm going to replace the Veldred rendering library with our own. I mm -hmm. already have a few things sort of written and tested 
Um, but that's, you know, that's a little bit down the line. But this is part of why I've made salt the way that it's made. Sure. Is so I can actually take Veldred and plug it out and plug our own stuff in there. Yeah, when the time is right and we we see the necessity for it, of course. So yeah. what is it like for you now? It's taking a step back because that's the, that's the general overview, right? Or is there something else that we missed? Um, once you go down back to uh, Chloride, which is the editor API, you can see that the implementation is called Helite, uh, which is another type of salt, by the way. Helite is rock salt. Mm -hmm. And that implementation specifically uses IM GUI, which is one of the most ubiquitous uh, immediate mode graphical user interface libraries out there. Amazing library, which is what we're using. As you can see, we have the Helite IM GUI.net, which is our own sort of interpretations and our own rendering stream for the IM GUI renderer, mm -hmm. uh, which is how we're rendering the the I am going elements. Mm. Well said. Cool. So that's that's a top sort of overview. Now that's that's a very big overview. The yeah. most important part at the moment uh, that we can go through. We can either go through the asset pipeline, and then, or we can go the entity component system. The entity component system is basically the heart of the engine. And and the asset pipeline. And the asset pipeline is well. If the ECS is the heart and the brain of the, of the engine, then the asset pipeline is basically the oxygen. <laughs> mm. So you can start with the ECS and then uh, talk about the asset pipeline. Okay, so an entity component system, in, in and of itself, which is what an ECS is, lives on three basic concepts. The entity, which is, as you can see from this piece of code, an entity is nothing. It is basically a number that is unique and exists in the system. That's all it is. An entity in our system, it's not like Unity's game object. Entity doesn't have any data, doesn't have any ideas of anything beyond the fact that it is a unique, a completely unique number. Mm -hmm. Now, we also have the next thing, the C part of the ACS is the component. Now, a component... Again, it's a very, very simple concept. A component is just a bunch of data. Mm -hmm. It's not like, again, it is not like Unity's or Unreal's uh, behaviors where they actually have functions that live in them. So our components do not have updates. They do not have awake. They, they do not have any knowledge of the things that need to work on them. The component in our case, it's something called a POD. It's just plain old data. Well, really. And one of the things that are, that is kind of hard to do in a managed language like C Sharp is to make sure that your components, that the things that you need to lay, to be laid out sequentially, are actually laid out sequentially. We have a few systems underneath which work. Try to make sure that the components are all of the same. They all live in the same line in the memory as much as we can because that actually reduces as we can see we'll see with systems in a minute accessing components that are in a linear order actually reduces cache hits on the cpu but i think we're going too deep into mm -hmm. the, yeah so that's that's a component that's the the data aspect of something it eventually gets mapped to the entity but we'll we'll wait for that in the system in the, for for a second the last part of an ECS which is the system uh, and in our in our framework it's called the component system because the word system already exists as a namespace for Microsoft thank you Microsoft <laughs> so I can't use just system because it annoys me to do uh, using the active all the time so I call it the component system <laughs> <laughs> all right a component system is very very simple in that sense the component system has three basic ideas behind it uh, you can initialize it with some context you can perform it and the last thing that you have which you can't see it is a special attribute that we attach to each system we basically say with that attribute which components the system needs in order to work so a system works on arrays of components in the so that's a system a system basically all the system does it tells the runtime which components it needs 
the runtime goes and looks for those components and basically plug those components into the system. That's basically it. However, to create and work with entities, components, and systems, we need to actually start creating objects that manage them. The objects that manage our component systems and entities in our framework, they're called registries. We have all of them here and they're all combined into something called an entity domain. If you're familiar with Unity, the entity domain is basically a scene. Although for us, game scene means something slightly different. It has a bit more metadata, but the entity domain can actually, let's look at the interface. You can rename entities, remove entities, remove components, add components and create entities. On top of that, we have something called the ECS runtime, which is the main entry point into the ECS itself. And that's what the game uses. So the ECS runtime manages our entity domains and it manages our systems. This supports any game. And the game basically is defined by the systems and components that we have. Currently, the two default components that Salt supports are a camera and it's missing at the moment a few things uh, like the entire camera. We've just started adding it back on Thursday and a transform. A transform is basically just position, rotation, and scale in space. That's all it does. Yeah, it's things that work. It's things that worked before, but you're just reattaching them. Yes. So we, we've got to the point now that we have the concept of systems, the concepts of components, and concepts of entities are working together. And now we're adding back all of the components and systems that we have. So for example, the first system we're going to have is going to be a rendering system. And the rendering system is going to work on cameras and transforms. So what the system would do, it would ask the ECS runtime, give me all of the entities with the transforms and cameras. And then the rendering system will get all of them in two arrays and it'll just run on those arrays and do something with them, do rendering with them mm -hmm. in that particular case. So that means you're still reattaching the rendering? Uh, no, the rendering stream is here somewhere already up and running we just need to connect the actual rendering with cameras because at the moment it renders yep. without cameras <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes so the rendering is working uh, we're going to attach once we have in the following days yeah, hopefully man. no more than a week two weeks tops we're going to have components such as voxel map voxels uh, components like player first person controls we have components that have gonna have bots on them and yeah, yeah. components that are gonna mash renderer components animation components all of those things and then on top of that we have all the systems that actually take those components that particular data and perform something with it a system is basically a function that does something on a lot of components mm -hmm. and that's basically the, I, I, I say the word basically a lot i think uh, I just noticed. And I say, you know, I know, you know a lot. <laughs> yeah, so to test things, I'm starting from the simplest components, which is a transform and a keyboard movement on that, on that transform. As you can see, the keyboard movement, very simple, has lists of key codes, which is left, right, up, down, forward, backward, and the speeds. Once I know that this works, it's very simple. Once the system works, I can start adding more stuff back. Yeah. Because we already add most of these things, so it's just reattaching. So can you explain, because I've said this several times in the past, that because they did see us, you know, running. See, I told you I said you know a lot. They, <laughs> they've they seen us opening uh, Ace of Spades maps. They've seen us moving around the level. We have the render distance already, the fog. Uh, we even, if you remember, managed to drop some, like, uh, snow voxels and shoot voxels. So, why the reattachment? Can you explain what changed and happened that we had to, like, take another step back, finick around with the engine, and then reattach everything? Why did that have to happen? Yes. So, the previous iteration of the engine was bit, was missing. Uh-huh. Yeah, they said it. <laughs> was missing... A concept from the systems. I couldn't really use the renders as systems within the entity domains. Cause? And what that caused dependency issue 
between the ECS and the rendering systems, which meant a lot of the systems that we wrote couldn't be automated. The components had to be queried by hand and it was slower. I couldn't cache any of them and it took a long time. It was very complicated for the rendering systems to actually ask the ECS to give the components that it needed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't very happy with that design. It wasn't a good design. Mm -hmm. So that And I made the call. Yeah. And I made the call. And one of the consequences of that is that when we started adding the physics system, I couldn't add it as a proper system. The rendering weren't proper systems. And then the physics wasn't the proper system. And because of that, the communication lines between the ECS and the rendering and the physics kind of broke down. Mm -hmm. And I had to sort of, I had to patch it in a very sort of crooked way. There's something called technical debt. And that was a very, very big technical debt to take on. Mm -hmm. And for better or worse, some would say worse. I know because it delayed us, mm -hmm. I think, three months now. Yeah. Again, we're working on this. I'm working on it one maybe two days a week so every delay kind of kind of pushes everything back by months yeah i made the calculation just if anybody is curious in generally i'd say considering what we're looking at now and what we have up until this day you've worked i would say an average total of 180 days since we started this project that's not much no it's not much meaning we what we sit together once a week which is four times a month Times that by twelve months, you get forty-eight, you know, days, which are not, by the way, full working days. You know, you arrive at like five thirty, we eat, we yeah. start coding properly at like seven thirty around midnight. One, we want zero punctuation at some point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we we usually fall around like one a.m. So if we take that almost, I'd say, close to three years now, it runs up to about one hundred and eighty days. So I think that. Good progress for 180 days, even with that setback, if you know what I mean. But the big question is, and that's what we, we understood, that's kind of the risk that you take when you make these kind of systems, but this is not gonna, that's not something that's going to happen again, correct? Absolutely. I think one of the things that I really came to realize in the last couple of months and have focused really for myself in the last maybe a few weeks, you know what I mean? is the importance of value for clients, not just for me. So when I said in the start of this uh, talk, I said one of the things we have to cut out is ego. Mm -hmm. I meant not just in the sense I'm not attached to my code. I know a lot of programmers, they kind of look at their code as, it's my code and you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm not attached to my code. I've never been attached to my code. Mm -hmm. I like learning. I like changing my coding habits. My coding habits have changed considerably over the last few years and 12 years, definitely, since I've started coding professionally. Understanding the value for the client is more of a focusing point. It's easy to say now, two yeah. years down the line, it's really, really easy to look back and say, ah, I should have done things differently. Of course, of course we should have done things differently. Mm -hmm. Because we now have two years of, of experience that we didn't have two years ago. And so somebody very smart once told me that you do the best you can at the moment that you do it. Yeah. Whether it's right or wrong, you do the best you can with the information you have. And that's, you can't beat yourself up over it. So what you can do is you can change from now on. Yeah. No, we're not going to go back and redo stuff. I think our journey from now on is the pre-production in the sense of redoing stuff is finished. Yeah, right. I'm 100% sure we have technical debt here. I'm 100% sure we are going to need to fix things and patch things. Of course. But we're going to do that while running forwards because I want this game to... I want to play this game already. My Let's kids are on my back yeah, yeah. asking me, my, my, my 11 year old is like, when can I play Born to Build? <laughs> yeah, I understand what you mean about ego, by the way. I just want to, sorry to cut you off. I just want to reiterate that even for me, talking from a design perspective, and we have the ship to game before the early access. And to me, 
to just ship something is always like the most terrifying part. The, 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 the funnest part is where you can still change things. You can still iterate, yeah. you can still make improvements because, you know, it's still, you know, there's a reason game developers have adopted the all early access thing because, you know, you can't really criticize it yet because it's not really done. <laughs> and yes. uh, there's a reason for that because it's a psychological thing as well. But I think it's, so I understand where you're coming from. It's for me and I know for Amen it's the same. It has to happen eventually because we, we do want to make a product and we do want to ship and we do want to open a studio. So of course it will happen. And I don't think you, I don't think when you made the decision, the way that you thought about it is just the ego there's always the the let's call it justification in the code that you can see the question is for me in video editing i can always sit and make something better and better and better and better but then i won't ship any videos at all and if you can see even on our youtube considering that i'm doing both a full-time job and freelancing and the game it's hard for me to commit to making more devlog episodes and you can see that you know i worked on the animations i did things to up to a certain level of quality that i feel comfortable with and to continue doing but there is a there is a kind of i would say something i heard before somebody say i think it was john karmic even that's it's about the, the fact that the more you know the less you re the, the, the less you're comfortable because you know how much more you don't even understand yet so it's always overwhelming and it's always a massive undertaking when you understand how systems work and how things work and you know not if i know that a lot of programmers won't want to show their code you know what i mean uh because it opens them up to criticism but i think it's an important part and i think game developers in recent years if they have lost something is the ability to handle criticism <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah i think it's a it's a natural thing to be afraid of but as both a freelancer and somebody who did some Got a lot of rejections for voice acting roles and whatnot and things that I did on the side. You know, it's just part of it. So criticism is something that's always going to be there no matter what our form. I think for you to come to that realization now because you've never been tasked with just making an engine like this or framework, you know what I mean? The entire game, the entire studio is basically sitting on it. So I can completely understand where you're coming from, if you know what I mean? I do. I've been programming since I was about... 10, maybe 11 years old. I've started on the Commodore 64. I have a very good knowledge and understanding of code and the way code thinks, <laughs> in mm -hmm. a sense. But a role like this and working within a team and working to deliver something this complicated and this large, I haven't done before. And it's, it's a learning experience. And I have like I said, I've learned a lot, unfortunately. The mistakes that I've made or the decisions that, that I have taken, they have a cost. We yeah. are not working on this full time. And no. we don't have uh, yet. You know, millions of dollars. We don't have millions of dollars invested in it yet. Yeah. So the cost that we pay, and there is a payment yeah. for everything, the cost is time. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it is not an easy cost. And no. for that I and I see how much that cost you too and I I I do I am sorry for that. That was I can't say that it was the wrong decision, mm -hmm. but it definitely a decision that cost more than I expected. And I should have yeah, should have should have yeah. would have could have. Of course. But I have learned to actually see that particular cost now in advance for all of my decisions when it comes to code and I see it in my work now, my day-to-day -day work, mm -hmm. and on my other projects when I'm working on them and helping my other people Yo. The, that I help when I can. Yeah, so that was definitely a learning experience. And going forward, Yo. going forward, it's not going to happen. I actually need to see my code running mm -hmm. for other people before I will actually make the decision to change it or that it's not good enough. Yo. So the biggest unknown at the moment for me is I have my tests. We've tested as much as we can independently. Mm -hmm. We need to get this done so we can test it with other people. And other people can tell me uh, how they break it. Because yeah. they're going to break it. Well, let's be honest here. They're going to break it. Especially me. <laughs> not especially you. But I'm, I'm actually talking not just about us as a studio. I'm mm -hmm. talking I want to get out to people as soon as possible because I want other people mm -hmm. to, to break my code. I can understand my code better. Mm -hmm. when it's stress tested like that well if you remember when we set out on the project and the reason i think 
that you, and again, what I like about you as a programmer is that where you know the fr- programmers who I would ask them to make a game framework and they'll just immediately say yes. It's not something that I usually come across. But for us, this, <laughs> for us, this project has always been to reach the other, first of all, to finish it and ship something by the yeah. end of it to be better developers. So even you reaching that uh, conclusion to become better developers, to improve at what we do, what we want to do for a living. So yeah, it did take longer. And again, pre- prefacing the effect of how how much actual time we had to work on this. It's a relative estimate that we had. I think it's about six to eight months more than what I had in mind. But again, we never worked on something this complex. So I think for now, I'm just wondering for you, I don't think it will be like maybe a breath of fresh air to just work on some, you know, physics and movement and... Yeah, it's finally gameplay. Because I know you do enjoy developing gameplay systems, just uh, system architecture. Yeah, I like the entire journey. Or programming i've discovered i like the design aspect of it i like the solving the the big issues mm-hmm. i like using those solutions to make games i've always wanted to make games that's yep. the only thing i has been a constant in my life Same. you know i've done the army yeah, yeah. i've worked on farms i've worked in coffee shops i've worked in ice cream shops mm-hmm. i've worked all around in many many places and many different jobs and i've always had a laptop on my back. Yeah. My wife always called it the second wife. Yeah. Always wrote code. And it was always code for making games. Yeah. My kids are my constant, but also making games. <laughs> it's, it's I've never lost it. Every time I open a video game now, I like I play it for 10, 20, 30 minutes and then I close it and go, Yeah, I, let's go make some games. That was that was nice. But now I should make games, not play them. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean I do believe that every uh, game developer has to play games. Uh, even if uh, you enjoy it less and you have less time, it's important to see what other developers are doing and get inspired. It's like reading, you know, it's like being a writer without reading. It's something that you yeah. need to do. To my greatest shame, I still haven't played Ace of Spades. I will at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah but, instead of Ace of Spades, I'm just going to play Born to Build yeah, at some point. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know what? I think it's better that you don't play it yet and we'll give you to play. We'll get you. This can be actually an awesome episode. To get you to play Ace of Spades only after you've played Born to Build and see how you feel about the movement and the controls and all that. That can be very interesting. But you did play around with Ace of Spades. I like you haven't touched it at all. We did like log into maps and play around with movements. You did understand how, like how they... Uh, you remember when we talked about the collider for the soldier, for the player? You know, moving around, seeing how it feels. So it's not like you haven't touched it at all. We spent a lot of time in the game itself. We just haven't played it as a game. More as like a technical overview kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that's... Um... Uh, that's a problem with opening any game at the moment. It's the same as filmmakers. You know, they go of watch course. a movie and it's like they're looking at the camera angles, yep. and the colors, and the, the voice. Like that's for me as a video editor. I can tell you, I know every time there's a dramatic scene or something happening, I, all the only thing I hear is sound effects that I have on my computer. So yeah, games and the passion to making them is something we both share and we both enjoy. And I personally, you know, that I can't wait. I can't wait to just delve into the gameplay and stop and stop looking at all the technical stuff. I mean, I enjoy seeing it so organized and seeing how it all works and it's so optimized and, and and you know, it's all good. But like as any publisher would tell you, it's like, that's all great. Where's the product? You know, <laughs> that's always going to be the the end, uh, the end result. So I'm hoping, and again, we're not announcing a release date yet. I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> I've decided. Yeah. I don't care. I don't <laughs> because care. Because of me, by the way. If yeah, yeah. Asking. It's not just that. It's also because of just the mental stress of it, of every time, if you miss a date, I have to go. I'm, I'm the one who has to go up and explain it. So I just like, you I know, know, it's like, it, it's like, it's going to be ready when it's ready. And uh, as long as we keep enjoying making it, then it's, it's, I think you've done incredible amounts of progress on this game considering how little time you actually spent writing the code for it. It feels like forever, but it's really not a lot. 180 days for finishing pre-production for a game engine is not a lot. Yeah, I just don't sleep much. Same. Um, I mean, it's 1am now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my favorite part of the game is the silliest part to be the favorite part, and it's always going to be my favorite part. When I press F5 and I see that log, the console log, I'll show you. This is my favorite part. Just this. Just to see it run up, man. Just to see all of this. And it's just crazy. Yeah, I just want to say before you start summarizing, mm-hmm. uh, there is a lot more to the engine and 
a lot more to the code that I, I, I would love to show. Um, one of the best concepts that came kind of like by accident into the, into the engine, and it's one of the best and worst things ever is called the context object. Man. We abuse it quite a lot, but it is awesome. We'll see how our soldiers take to this. I'm sure those, you know, the more technical minded ones will enjoy it. And uh, I'm all for doing another uh, deep dive once we have some more gameplay systems in place and we have something a bit more visual to show them. I, I can just whet the appetite. And one other thing is that this is only one solution. This is only the engine side itself. We also have this which mm -hmm. is the engine tools there are like command line tools that are built specifically for modifying the engine and making life easier on us mm -hmm. as as a development thing there's so much the bootstrappers here there's so much more to sort of just talk about about making an engine than sure. just the renderer so a lot of people would always start with just make a render and go for it but there's so much more when you start building something from scratch and not use unity or unreal or godot we take for granted when we use other people's tools of course we take for granted so many things like updating the dependencies mm -hmm. how do you even connect dlls how do you load what's an asset there's no such thing as an asset there's so many things that i've had to sort of think about and build from scratch and i write code really weird I know that. I've seen other people, people have told me that I write code in a very specific way, which is very me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Grandy said the same thing. It's my engine. Of course. <laughs> but it's more than that. It's it's clearly the right way of writing code. <laughs> no, and there's no such thing as right way. the right way to write. Objectively <laughs> the right way to write code. Um, it's not, but it's, I think about it in very specific in weird ways and there's so many things i can i can show and i want to show and how sure. i i kind of think about things but that for another episode it's exciting for me to hop into gameplay soon and to show you guys even more so Emil, thank you really thank you for taking the time i'm sorry i'm, I'm not putting you on more but you can understand my uh <laughs> you know i still have to manage the whole thing and i'd rather you just write down and do the do the work I think it's easier for you also to discuss these things now that it's more, I'd say, constructive. So you can just take a look at it and say, yes, this is this was correct. This was a mistake. This is what I did right. This is what I did wrong. Because when you're in it, you're still figuring it out. I think it's impossible to answer. Yeah, we've closed a lot of questions when it comes to the framework, which means that now we have time to start asking a lot of other questions and find the solutions to those questions. And it's not going to be questions about the framework or the engine. It's going to be questions about the game. It's going to yeah. be questions about the assets, stuff like that. Every game engine that exists or game framework has answered the same questions with different answers that worked for them. Yes. That's what game development is at the end of the day. It's, you have, it's just problem solving. <laughs> and every engine like Unity, Unreal, or Godot, or whatever... They had to ask the same questions and come up with their own answers and solution to what they were aiming to achieve. I think what you were aiming to achieve is to make a game engine that's written in your way, that's suitable for our needs. And as long as nobody gets hit over by a truck, <laughs> we should be... Or an anvil fall on their head. Yeah, we should be moving forward now to the more visual side of game design and development which is my of course personal favorite element because it allows me to dive with you again because you can understand why for me i'm sitting with you in the same room but we're not really working together because i'm more on the assets i'm more on the visuals i'm more on other things and you and hey man can work on the engine together more closely so for me i also miss just working with you on systems you know what i mean like that you're pushing an update and I'm using it and I give you feedback. It's something that I haven't done with you, hey, I think, since we started this game. While. Yeah, for a long while we haven't done that. But we will be very soon. So uh, thank you for taking the time, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I enjoyed think, it. I think we should pick up and do another one uh, once we have some gameplay systems. Because imagine doing the same thing with a podcast, with a devlog format and showing the actual game footage, you know, finally showing in-game gameplay. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. And uh, just uh, moving on and seeing where we can end up at the end of the year. So I'm cautiously optimistic. 
So am I, actually. I feel like we're moving forward. I felt like I've, well, my decision, like we said, my decision got us stuck in the muck for a bit, um, a bit yeah. more than a bit. But now we're, we're moving forward, and it, it's, it is exciting stuff. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us, soldiers. So I know it's been a long and technical one, but uh, okay. even, even if it's for me, maybe I'm too close to it, but it is interesting for me just as a designer to go through the systems because, okay. you know, I've seen glimpses of it here and there, but this is like the first or second time we're doing okay. a whole overview for it. So it's really cool to see how it all uh, functions and comes together. And uh, next time we have this discussion, we're going to have some uh, gameplay footage to show you. I can't wait to save those video files called born to build underscore gameplay, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Have a good night and stay safe out there. Good night, everyone.